This video is brought to you by NordPass. Check the link in the description below for a special deal for the Religion for Breakfast audience. If you head to kjv1611.org, the online merch store for the Bible Baptist Bookstore in Pensacola, Florida, you'll find this poster, a big black Bible standing on top of a mountain, crowned king. On the spine you see AV1611, which stands for the Authorized Version, or more commonly the King James Version, published in 1611. Below the mountain are piles of forgotten and vilified Bible translations. The New King James Version, the New International Version, the NRSV, the RSV. The poster's message is clear. In the competition of Bible translations, the King James Version is the King of the Mountain. This bookstore is the clearinghouse for the late Baptist pastor, Peter Ruckman. We call this Holy Bible the King James Authorized Version because it was translated under a king, and the Bible says where the word of a king is, there's power. A fundamentalist who held to a particularly extreme form of King James Onlyism, which, as the name suggests, is the belief that the King James Bible is the ultimate English translation of the Bible, superior above all other English translations, and even a divinely inspired translation. Now, I want to be clear, King James Onlyists don't simply prefer the King James Bible. There are many Christians, specifically Protestant Christians, who love the KJV for its poetic language. The these, thous, and shalt nots. For generations, the words of the KJV formed the common language for English-speaking Protestants worldwide. It's not an exaggeration to list the King James Bible alongside Shakespeare as two of the greatest influences on modern English. Its language is found in Handel's Messiah. Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. It's a big deal, and the KJV celebrated its 400th birthday in 2011, never having been out of print. But this video is not about people who prefer the KJV for its literary or artistic merit. We're talking about Christians who believe it's the best English translation on a sliding scale from those who believe it's the only uncorrupted English translation all the way up to those who believe it's a supernaturally inspired translation. Now, it's hard to get a precise figure on the size of the King James only movement, but as recently as 2011, one scholar estimated that the number of churches is about 1,000 worldwide, but the vast majority are in the United States, especially among independent Baptist churches. As the scholar James Henschel has said, the King James only movement is rather young, overwhelmingly Baptist, and thoroughly American. Specific examples include organizations like the New Independent Fundamentalist Baptist Churches, as well as the Baptist apologist Kent Hovind. God preserved his word for in English, and we've got it. Though King James onlyists can also be found in Seventh-day Adventist and Pentecostal churches as well. But where did the King James Bible come from? What about the King James Only movement? And is the KJV really a particularly accurate translation in the first place? Published in 1611, the KJV was by no means the first English translation of the Bible. There were several major translations that paved its way, especially the translations done by the Englishman William Tyndale. In the early 1500s, Tyndale translated much of the Bible into English from Greek and Hebrew manuscripts. And although Tyndale was eventually burned at the stake by church authorities in 1536, his so-called Tyndale Bible became the template for later translations. Two years later, King Henry VIII commissioned an English Bible for his newly established Church of England, calling it the Great Bible, which was based heavily on Tyndale's work. Then, when Henry's daughter, Queen Mary I, restored Catholicism in 1553, some Protestant Bible translators fled the country, most of them to Switzerland, where they produced the Geneva Bible. It was very popular among Protestants, but because it was the work of scholars persecuted by Catholic royalty, it had a decidedly anti-monarchy and anti-Catholic tone. For example, in the book of Exodus, which just so happens to be a story of an oppressed people escaping a tyrant, the translators explained in the margins that it's okay to disobey a monarch if that monarchy is not godly. When Queen Elizabeth I returned England to Protestantism, she authorized her own Bible, the Bishop's Bible, once again drawing heavily on the Tyndale Bible. But the Bishop's Bible was a complete dud. Critics complained it was not readable, its translators were inconsistent in their sources, and the first edition had some pretty significant errors. The Tyndale Bible, the Great Bible, and the Bishop's Bible all led to the King James Bible. When King James I ascended the throne in 1603, factions of English Christians were at each other's throats. 
James wanted to appear both a peacemaker and a reformer. So, in 1604, he brought the factions together at his Hampton Court palace. The Puritan delegation suggested a Bible translation, but James settled on a revision that would heavily rely on the pro-monarchy Bishop's Bible. He appointed a few dozen translators to prepare the new translation, using the best Hebrew, Greek, and Latin manuscripts available at the time, and to use margin notes only where absolutely necessary. The new Bible was published in 1611. It included the Old Testament, the New Testament, and the Apocrypha, or what's called the Deuterocanonical books, books that are not accepted by all as genuine or inspired. It also heavily relied on earlier translations. One linguistic study found that 84% of the KJV's New Testament and 76% of its Old Testament are based on Tyndale's translations. At first, a lot of people did not like the new Bible. Critics called it harsh and uncouth. Writing at the time of its publication, the Irish clergyman Ambrose Usher said, The cook hasted you out a reasonable sudden meal. The Puritans didn't like it because it contained the Apocrypha and because they considered it pro-monarchy, so they stuck with their Geneva Bibles. But what's important for our study here is that it became the most prominent English Bible in the American colonies. Until the Revolutionary War, there were no English language Bibles printed in America. But when Virginia became a royal colony in 1624, the King James Version was the Bible of choice, and its popularity began to grow. By the early 1800s, American printers started producing King James Bibles locally. A lot of them. A Philadelphia publisher captured the market for about 20 years, and in 1816, a former member of the Continental Congress founded the American Bible Society, with the goal to print the King James Bible and to get it into as many hands as possible. By 1860, they were distributing over 1 million KJV Bibles per year. The scholar of American religious history, Brian Wilson, says it's for this reason that the King James Bible became one of the most generally available and widely read books from the eastern seaboard to the western frontier. And it's here in the 1800s that we begin to see the first glimmers of the King James Only movement, even though we don't know its precise origins. For example, check out this document. You're looking at the minutes from a meeting of the Tennessee Association of Baptists. It took place in October of 1817. On the agenda, they were concerned that local Baptists had accepted an alternate English translation other than the KJV. They assert in the meeting that the Old and New Testament translated by order of King James I has been always the standard for the Baptists. They then go on and condemn anyone who proposes alternate translations. We believe that any person, either in a public or private capacity, who would adhere to or propagate any alteration of the New Testament, contrary to that already translated by order of King James I, ought not to be encouraged and have no fellowship with them. So here we have a primary source document suggesting that some sort of King James onlyist beliefs were shared by Baptists as early as 1817. But the movement wouldn't really take off until decades later in 1881, with the publication of the English Revised Version, an update to the King James Bible sponsored by the Church of England. When the ERV appeared, the Anglican scholar John Burgeon published a 500-page rebuttal of almost every single change made to the text. He didn't go so far as to declare King James only, but he was so close to this position that modern King James onlyists count him as one of their own. Then, in the 1930s, a Seventh-day Adventist named Benjamin G. Wilkinson wrote Our Authorized Bible Vindicated, the first book-length KJV-only argument. Then, in the 1950s and 60s, we get Baptist writers like Peter Ruckman, who we mentioned at the start of this video. These guys expanded Wilkinson's thinking to declare the KJV's 17th century translators were divinely inspired and had produced another revelation of God. Then, in 1973, the New International Version, or the NIV, was published. Here's a copy of it right here. Uh, the NIV Bible. Uh, crafted by 15 evangelical scholars, the NIV was written in contemporary English and was designed to be the Bible that would unite the different evangelical denominations and independent churches. Plenty of evangelicals loved the NIV. It remains one of the most popular English language Bibles in Christian bookstores, if not the most popular version ever sold, having sold over 450 million copies worldwide. But the KJV crowd hated it. 
Chief among these were Peter Ruckman and a woman named Gail Ripplinger. Gail Ripplinger became a rock star to the movement because of her book New Age Bible Versions, published in 1993. The book essentially argues that so-called New Age believers are in league with Satan and aim to undermine the word of God. Kent Hovind himself promoted her book in his talks. Well, this one, the New Age Bible Versions, is excellent by Gail Ripplinger. While this movement may be small, it's alive and well today. While researching this video, I found that some of the strongest critics of the movement are Baptists, and some of the most strident rebuttals that I read came from Baptist seminarians and ministers. My hunch is that while this might be a fringe movement within Christianity as a whole, it hits closer to home within Baptist circles, where it might come up more often. Writing in 2011, Jeffrey Straub of Central Baptist Theological Seminary said, There does not appear to be any realistic hope that the KJV-only position will die out any time in the near future. If anything, the internet has made the dissemination of even the most extreme forms of KJV-onlyism accessible to a worldwide audience. But let's turn to the question, is the King James Version even a particularly good translation? And why do King James Onlyists argue it's the best? But before we get to that, a quick word from our sponsor, NordPass. Brought to you by the same cybersecurity experts who built the privacy app NordVPN, NordPass is a powerful new generation password manager. NordPass enables you to organize all of your passwords in one place, basically storing your logins in a secure password vault protected by a master password. NordPass also has a ton of other features to help you keep your logins secure and organized. And if you need a new password for a new account, NordPass has a secure password generator that will automatically create for you a secure password. NordPass also enables you to share your password with others, so you don't need to share passwords over less secure emails or messaging apps. They're currently offering their Spring Forward sale. You can get 70% off two years of their premium plan, plus one month free. Just head on over to nordpass.com slash religionforbreakfast or use the coupon code religionforbreakfast. Okay, back to the show. For this section, I'll be relying on research from the scholar Bart Ehrman, who is an expert on New Testament manuscripts and text criticism. He actually was a research assistant back in the 80s during the development of the New Revised Standard Version. It's the preferred version for many scholars, myself included, especially in the United States. I put the link in the description below to one of his lectures if you'd like to watch his full analysis. According to Dr. Ehrman, there are several issues with the King James Bible that fall into three categories. Changes in the English language since 1611 that can affect how modern English readers interpret the Bible today, theological biases in the translation, and issues with the manuscripts used when creating the translation in the first place. Let's start first with the changes in the English language that affect how we read the text today. I'm not necessarily talking about quirky or idiosyncratic translation choices. For example, many of you might be familiar with the fact that unicorns appear in the King James Bible. Deuteronomy 33.17 mentions his glory is like the firstling of his bullock, and his horns are like the horns of unicorns. This is probably a mistranslation of a Hebrew word that probably refers to some sort of wild ox. The Greek word for single horned beast somehow found its way into the Greek Septuagint translation of the Hebrew Bible, which then ended up in the KJV. Other mythological creatures appear in the KJV as well, but I personally feel this is pretty minor compared to other issues with the text. But what I think is even more serious than outdated words are verses that look like they make sense in modern English, but actually mean something completely different. For example, check out Philippians 3.20. The KJV says, For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. What the KJV translates as conversation is the Greek word polituma, which means citizenship or commonwealth. Thus, the NRSV translates it as, but our citizenship is in heaven. And it helpfully includes a footnote directing the reader to the alternate translation, commonwealth. In my opinion, the KJV translation is a serious problem. If you're conducting a Bible study and you're trying to explicate this verse while relying on the KJV, the translated word conversation could trip you up. It could cause you to miss a very interesting aspect to what the Apostle Paul is trying to say by using this word with political and administrative undertones. There are many other examples like this, but let's move on to the next category, theological biases of the translators. Several passages in the King James Bible seem to be the result of Christian theological biases swaying the translator's decision-making. 
For example, some of you might be familiar with the story of the fiery furnace in the book of Daniel. It's a story about three Judean youths who end up on the wrong end of the Babylonian king's justice system and end up being thrown into a fiery furnace. According to the text, a miracle then occurs. The NRSV reads, He replied, But I see four men unbound, walking in the middle of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the fourth has the appearance of a god. The NRSV helpfully includes a footnote with the alternate translation of the Aramaic word, a son of the gods. This translation suggests some sort of angelic being joins the three men in the fire, protecting them. But notice what the KJV translation does. Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the son of God. The translators use the title Son of God rather than the more literal, a Son of the Gods. Son of God is a title for Jesus Christ in the Gospels and makes the verse sound like Jesus was in the furnace with the three men. Another example of theological bias comes from 1 John. For those of you that are familiar with Christian doctrine, you'll know that God is conceptualized as one being with three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, aka the Trinity. In the King James Bible, 1 John 5 verses 7 through 8 include an explicitly Trinitarian formula. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. This phrase appears in the Latin translation of the Bible, but not in any Greek translation. It almost certainly was not part of the original text of 1 John, and all modern critical editions exclude it. But without it, the Bible contains no explicit mention of the Trinity, a core Christian doctrine, which may explain why some Christians have resisted excluding it from modern translations. And this example leads us to the third issue with the King James Bible, the manuscripts. This gets a little technical, so buckle up. The King James Onlyist argument hinges on a conflict between something called critical editions of the Bible and the Textus Receptus, Latin for the received text. I'll define these in turn. First, critical editions. Modern translations of the Bible are the result of biblical scholars piecing together the text from manuscripts. Some of these manuscripts contain nearly complete versions of biblical texts, like the Codex Sinaiticus, which is a 4th century manuscript that contains the entire New Testament. Other manuscripts are just tiny scraps of papyrus with only a few verses on them. The goal of a modern critical edition is to get as close as possible to the original text. So scholars look at all available manuscripts, compare them, and then create what they think is the closest to the original. The KJV, on the other hand, relies on later manuscripts. The Old Testament translation relies mostly on what's called the Masoretic Text, which are Hebrew manuscripts from the 9th and 10th centuries, and the New Testament relies mostly on the Textus Receptus, which is the Greek New Testament published by the Dutch priest and scholar Erasmus in the 1500s. Erasmus was working with a few very late Byzantine manuscripts that were available to him, and in some cases he needed to back-translate some of the verses that were missing in his Greek manuscripts from Latin manuscripts. Later scholars modified Erasmus's texts, but these are still called the Textus Receptus. The French Protestant theologian Theodore Beza, for example, created an edition that was the most popular manuscript used by the KJV translators. The simple fact is, the KJV was created before many of the greatest manuscript discoveries that revolutionized our knowledge of the original texts of the Bible. First, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Before the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls in the 1940s, our earliest manuscripts for the Hebrew Bible were the Masoretic Texts, which date basically 1,000 years later. The KJV was also published before the discovery of the Codex Sinaiticus, the oldest complete manuscript of the entire New Testament, as well as dozens of manuscripts from the sands of Egypt. Because of this, modern critical editions are much closer to older manuscripts because modern scholars had access to them. But for some KJV onlyists, older is not necessarily better. Part of their argument rests on the fact that the Textus Receptus agrees with the majority of manuscripts, which sounds like a good thing until you realize that the majority of manuscripts are quite late. Old manuscripts are rare, so most manuscripts date to the 9th century or later. And for some books, like the letters of the Apostle Paul, Modern critical editions really need to rely on earlier manuscripts to try to get as close as they can to the original text. As the scholar Daniel Wallace says, for the letters of Paul, not even one majority text manuscript exists from before the 9th century. To embrace the majority text for the Pauline epistles then requires an 800-year leap of faith that they haven't changed. 
Which is why early manuscripts like Codex Sinaiticus, which does include the Pauline epistles, are so helpful for modern scholars. These issues lead Bart Ehrman to conclude that the KJV is one of the worst study Bibles you could possibly use. Ultimately though, these battles are huge exaggerations, and they really don't matter that much in the end. Except for a very few instances, like the Trinitarian Statement in 1 John, no Christian doctrine is affected by the differences between modern critical editions and the Textus Receptus. They agree somewhere between 98 and 99% of the time. So, in the end, this debate is only about trimming around the edges of the whole Bible. King James Onlyism is an interesting case study for Christian fundamentalism, and specifically evangelical Protestant fundamentalism. But what do I mean by this? Fundamentalism is a tricky term for scholars. As the anthropologist of religion Dr. Henry Munson writes, fundamentalism is a crude and controversial term. It more often is used as a polemic to attack particular religious groups as fanatics, rather than using the term as a practical analytical category. Now, some religious studies scholars do use it as a comparative category. In this case, fundamentalism could imply a group's extremism, militancy, or certainty and defensiveness of specific beliefs, ideologies, or practices. I'm using the term fundamentalism much more narrowly here to refer to a form of evangelical Protestantism that emerged in the 19th and 20th centuries. For these Protestants, fundamentalism is actually a term of self-description, a label for those who hold to certain fundamentals of the faith. Starting in 1910, a Protestant Christian group published a series of essays called The Fundamentals that stipulated what all Christians should believe, though through a Protestant lens. According to the historian George Marsden, Protestant fundamentalism really took off in the 1920s, though, as a reactionary backlash against modernism, a backlash against the theory of evolution, growing popularity of liberal theology, and biblical critical scholarship. As you might have picked up in this video, the publication of new Bible translations was the animating force behind the King James Onlyist movement. All of the criticism was leveled against scholarly critical editions. But scholars of fundamentalism in recent years have modified Marsden's anti-modernism theory. For example, the historian Margaret Bentroth notes that Christian fundamentalism is selectively anti-modernist. Christian fundamentalists are often on the cutting edge of technology, from radio to television, and now even TikTok. Moreover, fundamentalists are not isolationists, as Marsden suggested. Other historians like Matthew Avery Sutton argue they have consistently worked to reform and transform their culture in ways that match their beliefs and ideologies, which is what we see with the modern Christian nationalist movement in American politics. So, Christian fundamentalism is not necessarily an attempt to turn back the clock, but rather it's a form of ongoing resistance and protest against what they perceive to be the dominant culture. For those of you who would like to dig more into this topic, I'm including my sources in the description below. Thanks everyone for watching, and I'll see you next time.